this morning, look with me in Acts chapter 16. Again, we're na still navigating the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 24. Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 24. And there we'll find these words written in Acts chapter 16, verses 19 through 24. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Last week when we preached about what happens when Christianity and culture collides, we saw how Paul had dealt with those who were so easily deceived by syncretism and why it's important for Christians to know how to engage the culture with Christ. This morning I want to continue along those uh, that same subject of uh, when Christianity and culture collides. And I want to give it a, this message a subtitle of Collision Backlash. I want to talk about Collision Backlash as part two of this when Christianity and culture collides. If you remember, Paul had intended to go to Asia and Bithynia to preach the gospel. But the Holy Spirit forbade him to go do so, and after having a vision of a man of Macedonia requesting help, uh, he, along with Silas and Timothy, immediately go to Philippi, which is a chief city in Macedonia. Now, up to this point, I have not said anything about who this man of Macedonia might be. That's because nothing else is said about him. And we don't know whether Paul actually meets him upon his arrival, okay? Now, some biblical scholars have suggested that this man of Macedonia is possibly Luke, the physician, and he's also the author of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. This is suggested because there seems to be a shift in the author's designation of who's traveling with Paul indicated by what is known as the we passages of Scripture. When you read the book of Acts, a close examination will show that up to this point, to chapter 16, the author has been writing in the third person using the pronouns he and they, okay? But beginning here in chapter 16, verse 8, he shifts to the first person plural pronoun using we, ours, and us. And I'll try not to labor here long, but I think it's important for us to understand why this is so and why important this is. First of all, historically, this shift in speech seems to support the fact that Luke now becomes an eyewitness of the events as indicated by the opening lines in the book of Luke, which is his first of two volumes, where he says he gives Theophilus an accurate account of the things most surely believed among us and to know the certainty of those things he was instructed in. Now, this is important because it goes directly toward the reliability of the scriptures. See, it's hard to refute evidence and testimony that's given by our witness. As a matter of fact, unless there is an eyewitness account or testimony or some corroborating evidence, it's not even admissible in a court of law. And with the onslaught, my brothers and sisters of biblical critics and those who deny the scriptures, we need to be sure that we know what we believe and how to defend the faith when we are challenged by those who don't believe the scriptures. But also, I believe it's important for us to note this because from the standpoint of the Holy Spirit, we see how God sovereignly hinders Paul to help Paul. 
That's right. God, God helps him by hindering him, by not allowing him to go to Asia where he wanted to go, but to Macedonia and probably pick up Luke who he needed. I'm getting a little feedback, brother, so help me out there. Amen. At that time, Paul probably had no idea of God's bigger purpose for him when God forbade him to go to Asia and Bithynia. But God wanted to give him a continent for Jesus in Europe and not just a few cities in Asia. He wanted to give him a personal doctor in Luke who not only gives us the book of Luke and Acts, but he'll also serve as Paul's personal physician. Now, the point is this, and I'm going to move on. We need to realize, my brothers and sisters, that God knows what he's doing when he tells us no. All right. And we need to learn how to say yes to his no's. All right. It's also interesting that although he has, Paul has this vision of a man of Macedonia saying come to help us, his initial counters in Macedonia and his ministry is with two women. First, he encounters this certain woman uh, named Lydia down by the riverside. And, and then he encounters this second woman, this damsel who's possessed with a spirit of divination. So far, he's established a small group connection with some faithful women who are consistently meeting for prayer down by the riverside. And now he's got this second damsel who he's given a new lease on life and have rid the community of one less religious racketeering ring who've been preying on people for who knows how long. Now, Brother Joan, that's been something that's been gnawing at my spirit all week long about these scenarios in this text here. And, and I need you all just to indulge me a moment because I see some modern problems in this 16th chapter. And let me be clear off the bat. Let me just be clear. This is not an interpretation of the text, okay, because the Bible only has one interpretation of every scripture, okay? okay so this ain't an interpretation but this is some applicational observations using some grant theology. All right? These are some applicational observations using some grant theology. And I make these observations in light of the cultural climate of our society today and the state of our homes, our churches, and communities, okay? So y'all pray with me and stay with me for a minute. Paul gets a vision from a man in Macedonia. He goes to Philippi, the chief city of Macedonia, and there's a problem. There's no synagogue because there's not 10 male heads of households, which was a requirement for the establishment of a synagogue. And there's not one in the entire city. Here's the problem. No house of worship and fatherless homes a lack of spiritual male leadership. Scenario number two, a group of women meet by the riverside in prayer but have no man to instruct them in the word of God. And I know, watch this now, even after Lydia's heart is open to the Lord and she and her household is saved and baptized, she didn't announce a call to preach. She didn't announce she's an evangelist now. And she didn't try to start a church. The problem, lack of spiritual male leadership. Third scenario, a damsel who's a soothsayer, who, who is a soothsayer controlled by a spirit of, of divination and spiritual abuse by evil men who use her as a means to finance their own sinful deeds. The problem, human trafficking. Lack of spiritual male leadership. Next thing, our text here, under consideration, where Paul and Silas have affected the economic base of the city. And I'm going to unpack that as we go. The powers that be respond by caving in to the culture and allowing spiritual antagonists to move them to hostility toward Christianity. The problem, religious persecution due to the lack of spiritual male leadership among the people. And then here, here, here's my last one. Uh, when Paul and Silas get placed in jail for what they've done, what jumps out at, me, out at me the most is not the prayer and praise party they have or the miraculous earthquake that occurs. That's important. But who's in prison with them? Prisoners, of course. 
male prisoners. Somebody's father, husband, brother, and son. Now, now here's where the grant theology kicks in. Could it be that the help needed in Macedonia came from a man in prison and not just a man in a vision? Could, could, could it be that, that, that God divinely orchestrated the events of chapter 16 to get the gospel not just to two women, but a whole lot of men in prison? Men who are, are bound, not just physically in chains, but, but more so in spiritual bondage. Men behind prison doors without the opportunity to open doors for their sons and daughters. Men locked in jail cells and locked out of jobs and economical and educational opportunities. Men kept away from women, which causes the women to have to fend for themselves and take on roles that they were never intended to take on. Now, I'm not sure how many men it was there in prison or what they were charged with, but I do know this. When you have more men in prison than in church, that's a problem. When, when there are more men in prison than in the home, that's a problem. When you have more men in the criminal justice system, keeping them from being the productive citizens in society that they could be, then the entire social system suffers tremendously, especially when there's no divine frame of reference and a Christian world and life view permeating that society. And in the phraseology of my, my late favorite father-in-law, Morris Bozeman, hey, say what you will to me, man. When, when there is a lack of God-ordained male spiritual leadership in the home, the church, and the community, the only thing you can expect is chaos, confusion, the cessation of moral and ethical standards, and ultimately the death of a society. Hmm. You remember, you remember uh, Abraham couldn't find ten righteous folk in Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know what God did to that city. And I am afraid, my brothers and sisters, that if we don't straighten up and walk right, we might be facing the same or similar consequences because we are already on a slippery slope of self-destruction right now. Okay, okay, I've, I've said more than I intended to say on that. But, 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 but muddle that in your mind. And if you've got any issues with one thing I said, just, you know, invite me to lunch and take me out and straighten me out on it, all right? All right? I'm moving on, moving on. Listen, you would think that Paul's actions in dealing with the damsel would have been, been, been commended by the community. They would have been happy he did that. Yet, even though he does the community of service by exercising this python spirit from this young girl, he's also made some enemies with the local businessmen who now have to find a way to recoup their losses as well as find another way of financing their means and making money. The Bible is true when it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It didn't say money was evil, but the love of money. Because anytime you affect people's money, you're going to pay a price for it. Here's something else I need you to consider. It, it seems like matters are worse for Christians when it comes to being accused of something. See, you see, it's not like Paul and Silas affected their money by implementing their own money-making scheme themselves. See, they weren't in competition with those folks in business, nor was that their main concern. Listen, you and I both know that, that people are going to make money in this world in ways that are legitimate, and even in more ways, according to laws and ethical standards, are illegitimate. I mean, even when it comes to giving in church, I can't judge what percentage, what percentage of the offerings come from the Golden Moon, Louisiana Downs, the office football pool, pick three, four, or five. Or even the friendly biz whiz gang with a $50 kitty. That ain't my ministry to determine where it come from. And that was not Paul's concern either. 
Paul's concern, as all believers concerned, is to seize opportunities to share the gospel that will allow the Holy Spirit to change the heart and that'll change the treasure focus of individuals. That's why the Bible says where your heart is, is where your treasures will be. And, and, and let me say this since I'm here, and I'm going to give y'all this for free. It, it does no good to call out folk who give an offering, yet their giving may come from questionable sources that you got an issue with. But on the other hand, you don't say a word about somebody that you know have money and they ain't gave $20 in five years to the church. And then they want to complain when the church asks for a pledge toward a worthwhile ministry effort or some church enhancement program or project. I, that's a sermon for another day. I, I, I preach on that another day. In, in the text today, Paul had affected the money of these men, and he and Silas now, Silas now are the targets of what I'm going to label as spiritual antagonists, okay? Now, I was tempted uh, to call them haters, because that's the popular term that people are familiar with today. You know, call it, everybody's a hater now. But I don't think the term haters carry the same force as an antagonist to describe these individuals in the text. See, a hater is a person who says or writes unpleasant things about someone or criticizes their achievements, especially on the Internet. And, of course, they didn't have Internet back then. A hater is somebody who's jealous of somebody else. And this was not the case in the text. See, I mean, if Paul and Silas had been engaged in the same business that these men were in, and was doing better than they were doing, and cut it into their money that way, then maybe the, the term haters might be appropriate. But it's not. See, these individuals are more of antagonists, okay? Now, an antagonist is a person who actively opposes or is hostile to someone or something. An antagonist is an adversary. See, if these men would have said, okay, we lost one girl. She, she don't work for us no more. You know, we, we, we'll just get us another one. Then maybe I wouldn't call them as such, okay? But they didn't. They are antagonists because of what they do afterwards shows their opposition and hostility as they launch an attempt to rid the city of Paul and Silas because they have become now an economic threat to them. And they are just not antagonists. They are spiritual antagonists because of the accusations leveled against them. See, this problem uh, was deeper than what they were doing or who they had lost. See, it's more about Paul and Silas's presence and what it means to that entire city. Because, you know, you just can't believe that the loss of one girl affected the whole thing. Now, of course, she probably was the major source of their game. But if you understand business, you know that small businesses support big business. And big businesses fund smaller businesses. And you don't know which business is in bed with which business so that all the businesses can get some business. I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that when they saw the hope of their game was gone, they realized that it just didn't affect them in their pockets, but it affected them in their power and their positions in society. And you know as well as I do, that there are people today who are in powers of position and have prestige, not because of their abilities, but because of their money. I just read the other day where a person gave a large donation to a high-ranking political official. And almost before the check could hit the bank, the donor had a government job. Now, 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 I'm not implying that anything was done illegally, but my point is this. Folks, folks with money take care of folks with money. And when folks' money issues begin to affect other folks and cause them to have money issues, then Bill Cox, somebody got to say something. <laughs> and then do something. And in this situation here, these spiritual antagonists cause collision backlash. And in response to Paul engaging the culture with Christ. And so, Bill, I hear you answer this question again. What, well, what do spiritual antagonists do? I'm going to help you, Bill. Here's my first point. 
Spiritual antagonists seek to embarrass you by exposing you. Spiritual antagonists seek to embarrass you by exposing you. The text says, and when her masters saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates. Why do you need to call them out before everybody? Why do they need to be taken to the public square and the marketplace? Why not deal with them privately? Well, I'll tell you why. That's because people like to highlight your faults before theirs begin to show. Now, now, now it's clear that, that Paul and Silas, they've not done anything wrong ethically, morally, or spiritually. It's just that these men want to send a message that if you mess with us and our money, we're going to expose you and embarrass you. We're going to put you on blast on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, TMZ, Inside Edition, and any other social media platform and news outlet that we can send you a strong message that money talks. And whatever we got to do to do it and hold on to what we have, we're going to do it and not let anyone, especially a bunch of Bible-toting, scripture-quoting preachers, mess with our money. We've seen this happen before. When light is shining on darkness and when righteousness seeks to reign, see, evil then raises its ugly head and going to try to stamp it out by any means necessary. And particularly when the church speaks truth to power, you can expect a backlash of persecution to follow. Hurry on, but not only do these spiritual antagonists seek to embarrass Paul and Silas by exposing them, but here's my second point. Spiritual antagonists will distort the truth to discredit your message. Spiritual antagonists will distort the truth to discredit the message. In the text, note the accusation leveled against Paul and Silas. It said, these men being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither observe being Romans. They are labeled as troublemakers, radical espousers of false doctrine, and racial instigators. But these are all concocted lies intended to discredit the true actions of Paul and Silas and discredit their testimony. Now, as far as being troublemakers, we've seen this charge leveled against believers before in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In, in Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 18, King Ahab uh, uh, sends Obadiah on an intense search to find Elijah. And then when Elijah finally meets Ahab, the first thing Ahab says to him is, is this, Art thou the one that has been troubling Israel? And Elijah said, I ain't been troubling Israel. But you and your father's house in that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you've been following Balaam. And then in the New Testament here in chapter 15, 16, and 17, Paul and his companions are charged with stirring up trouble. But you got to remember last week I said Christians don't stir up trouble or cause conflict, but we got to confront it when it comes. See, when trouble comes, somehow Christians will always get the blame even when the reality is that it's folks who forsaken the Lord and disobeyed his commandments. Paul and Silas here are charged with being troublemakers and are accused of teaching, teaching uh, customs which are contrary to what they believe. But see, Paul has only dealt with the woman at the riverside and his demon-possessed damsel. He's not said anything to these businessmen and nobody else. It's just that these men are upset because their money machine has been taken down. Now, it is quite possible, and it's apparent that this damsel has gone back, turned in her paperwork, quit the job, and let them know, I'm in, I'm in love under new management. <laughs> and therefore, they got to blame somebody for it. Now, understand, there was a law that no one was allowed to establish another religion without permission of the state. In other words, the state had to sanction all religions. They didn't care if you uh, had other beliefs or certain other gods. 
You just had to run it by them and get a license for it. So they were charging them with religio illicita or an illegal religion. I need to say this while I'm here. I still believe that America is the greatest nation in the world. Okay? But I'm afraid that God is gradually removing his hand off of us. Okay? It's interesting. It's interesting that in almost every other nation, there's no question about what the religion is in the country because they take their religion serious. Whether it's Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or Judaism, they take it seriously. However, here in this nation, a nation that is supposed to be founded on the Judeo-Christian tradition, a nation that has on its currency, in God we trust, a nation that touts itself as being the bastion of freedom and faith, somehow the faith of our fathers and the faith of our mothers has been synced together with the beliefs of any and every religion in the world. And to try to show that we are the land of opportunity and fair play, we'll accept any religious tradition and tolerate whatever ways they won't express themselves. Yet the one true faith of Christianity that's supposed to be the bedrock of this nation has been put out of every institution in society in some shape, form, or fashion. And when Christians try to seek to express their views, we're labeled as bigoted, intolerant, insensitive, narrow-minded, mean-spirited, unloving, and get this, we're not the kind of people that God can be pleased with because we ain't being Christians like Jesus. Because they said Jesus loved and accepted everybody, no matter what they did or how they lived. Jesus didn't judge nobody, they say. We have put nationalism before God, patriotism before Christ, and party pride before the Holy Spirit. God have mercy on us. I got to get out of here, y'all. I got to get out of here. But, but, but before I do, I, I need to say something about this racial innu innuendo in the text here. It's subtle, but it's, it's, it's stinging. They say, these men are Jews. We are Romans. And, and they are trying to influence us and impose their ways on us. They, they from a different side of town. And, and, and when in Rome or in Roman culture, you're supposed to do what the Romans do. So y'all go back in y'all neighborhood and take y'all custom with y'all. They trumped up false charge. It's just something about saying that. They're just. They trumped up false charges. Ah. They only told one side of the story and then they played the race card here just to make their case against Paul and Silas. Okay. Let me tell you why I said they played the race card. See, they only arrested Paul and Silas, the two Jews. Luke and Timothy are Gentiles, but you don't hear nothing about them being arrested. See, if this world can embarrass us as Christians, it will. If this world can expose us as Christians, it will. If it has to distort the truth to discredit us, it will. This is just some of the backlash that we're going to face as we collide with this culture. Why? Because we engage the culture with Jesus Christ. But here's my last point. I'm going to let you go. Spiritual antagonists will make allies with anybody as long as their end is achieved. Right? Spiritual antagonists will make allies with anybody as long as their end is achieved. In other words, Spiritual antagonists will stack the deck if they have to, and they ain't going to play fair. Right. Note the different groups in the text that's named in arresting and imprisoning Paul and Silas. In verses 19 through 20, it says, And when her, here the first one, masters saw the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, that's the second one, and brought them to the magistrates, that's three, and then verse 22 and 23 says, And the multitude, that's foe, rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer, that's five, to keep them safe. Now let's see what you got here. You got the masters, the businessmen. 
the rulers, the chamber of commerce and the business community, the magistrates, the judicial system, the multitude, the citizens, and the jailer, law enforcement. The whole city is in cahoots against Paul and Silas because they have spoken truth to power and the powers that be don't like it. And when Christianity and culture collides, you're going to see a whole lot of unholy alliances between various groups, secular and religious. And Christians will be the target because there's going to be collision backlash all because of Christ. My brother and sister, don't worry. And don't fret. Because God has never failed us yet. Light will dispel darkness. Truth will eradicate lies. Faith will overcome fear because Christ has overcome the world. And the reason I know this is because this ain't the first time this has happened. About 20 years before these spiritual antagonists took their best shot at Paul because of Christ, another group had done the same thing with Christ himself. Let me see. The inside man was Judas Iscariot, one of Jesus' own disciples. The powers that be was Pilate and Caiaphas and Herod. The Sanhedrin council comprised of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were the religious chamber of commerce. And of course you know that the multitude of the people were misled into voting for the wrong man because they chose Barabbas over Jesus. And just like they beat Paul and Silas with many stripes, they did the same thing to Jesus. But they went one step further. On a hill called Calvary. <laughs> they nailed him to an old rugged cross. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. And they crucified him like a common criminal. And on that cross, Jesus, the son of God, died for the sins of the world. He died for the spiritual antagonist. He died for the stubborn atheist. He died for the skeptical agnostic. He died for the crooked businessman and the straight up thief. He died for the witch doctor in Africa, the warlock in Europe, the sorcerer in the Middle East, and the psychic reader right here in America. He died to appease the justice of God. And in his death, God was satisfied. They buried him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed there three days and nights. But early, I said early. Early, 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 Sunday morning, uh, he got the grave uh, with all power in his hand. Uh, it was dark on Wednesday, dismal on Thursday, depressing on Friday, and disappointing on Saturday. But early, I said early, anybody know anything about Sunday morning? Uh, he got up. Ah, he got up with all power and authority in his hand and because Christianity collides with culture there will be a collision backlash but Jesus can deal with any backlash in your life he can deal with anything that you go through he can deal with any opposition that you have all you gotta do is just stand on the word of God trust him and he will fight your battles for you yeah, spiritual antagonists, they, they, they're going to try to embarrass you and expose you. They're going to try to discredit you and destroy you, and just distort your truth to discredit you. And they will align themselves up with anybody to achieve their end. But I heard Jesus say the other day, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I've overcome, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When Christianity and culture collide, expect collision backlash, but know that you got the victory because Jesus reigns supreme. Does he reign? Does he reign? Does he reign today? Oh, 
Uh, glory, glory, glory to his name. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you so much for your truth. Thank you so much that in the midst of spiritual antagonist, we can stand firm on your word because we know who holds the future, who holds the present, and who holds our hand right now. God, I pray you touch somebody's heart who may not know Christ as Lord and Savior. They'll believe that he died for sin, arose to justification, and they'll commit their life to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that there's someone who already knows him and want to unite this church. They'll come as you see fit to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you go, As you go forgive, somebody. forgive somebody. Someone needs forgiveness now. As the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, share the love of Jesus Christ. 